Hello, welcome back to this, our second session in our Love Membership class at International Baptist Church Berlin. I'm Scott Corwin, pastor. I hope that after the first session, you followed through on some of the decisions and some of the commitments that God has been moving you to make. I do want to make a brief comment. There are a couple of page references that are perhaps slightly different than you'll find in your syllabus. We'll correct those in future recordings. Also, I hope that if you're one that's still struggling with and wrestling with the whole idea of what it means to be a Christian, that you'll feel free to give me a call, contact me here in the church office or on my handy, and I'll be delighted to speak with you about what that means. Because we believe that a personal relationship with God, a real relationship with God, is the most important thing that is. And that's the reason why it's the first in our series of discussions in our love membership class. We talked about our salvation and what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. That was the first session. And today what we'll be doing is we'll be looking at, in this second session, our statements, what we believe and why we exist as a church. We asked that question, what makes IBC Berlin a family, a church family? The first, of course, is our commitment to Jesus Christ and what he has done for us through the cross. The second is our statements. And our church, like all other churches, have a certain personality, a certain way of living and doing things. And that's the reason why we believe it's important for us to take this time to create a session on our statements. As we do so, Here's a verse of scripture that reminds us of why it's so important. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 says, Let there be real harmony among you, so there won't be any split in the church. I plead with you to be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. We come from all over the world. We're now living here in Berlin. And for one reason or another, you are looking at the possibility of making a commitment to being a part of the church family at IBC Berlin. And we welcome that. We think that's a part of God's purpose for your life as a Christian, as we stated in our first session. At the same time, it's important that you find a place where God has called you to be a part of the family as it exists. You know, we're not perfect. But we do believe that God has a very specific purpose for us, and we believe that you need to know what that purpose is so that you can make a commitment to being a part of this church as God has called us to be a church. So we believe that talking about this in advance creates the opportunity for real harmony to be of one mind and united in thought and purpose, and us to move forward together as a church family committed to that one purpose. So take a look in your notes and you'll see on page 11 that we'll begin looking at our statements, starting with our faith statement, what we believe as a church. You've already heard something of what we believe as a church and it centers around Jesus Christ. And we believe that that is the beginning and the end of our life together. Uh, not only as individuals, but as a church family. Our faith statement you'll see on the next few pages in your document, in your syllabus, in your listening guide. We're not going to go through all of those statements, but I hope that you will take some time over the next few weeks just to take a look at what we state as our belief statement as a church. What you have here in this listening guide is a statement of our basic beliefs, these core beliefs, these foundational beliefs that we agree upon together in our life as a church. You'll see in the introduction to the notes that we have this statement. In basic beliefs, we have unity. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6 says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. What you'll see in the next few pages in the listening guide, that in our statement of faith, we have compiled 
a statement that is arranged around the core beliefs of historic biblical Christianity. And in these basic beliefs, we have agreed that in our life together, this is what we will teach, this is what we will practice. And so in these basic beliefs, we have unity. The second of the statements that you'll see there on page 11 is that in non-basic beliefs, we have liberty. In other words, if it's not stated specifically in these basic beliefs, then we recognize that Christians of good faith that are Bible-believing have legitimate differences of opinion about some of the matters that are more peripheral, not so central to orthodox, historic, biblical Christianity. And so in those matters, we have freedom to believe as God convicts us in our own hearts. And so in Romans chapter 14, you see this, accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. In this passage, Paul is writing to the Roman Christians and reminding them that each of us are personally accountable before God to our beliefs. And so there are matters about which we give the freedom and the liberty to disagree with one another. And in these matters, we believe that it is important for us to have a uh, ability to freedom, to have those opinions and those convictions, and to discuss those with one another. At the same time, we believe that this last of the statements is also true. In all our beliefs, we show charity, that is, love. As Paul wrote to the Corinthians, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. We believe that the priority of love should dictate how we disagree with one another. We have unity in the basic beliefs. We have liberty and perhaps even disagreement, but we cannot be disagreeable with one another in those matters. That's the reason why we say we show loving consideration with one another in all of these particular beliefs. So as you take a look at the statements that follow on page 12, 13, and following, you'll see that we have a variety of statements about God, about the Father, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Bible, about who we are and what the Bible teaches about our condition before God, statements about salvation, about discipleship, about eternal security, and about the church. Read through, through those and take a look at those and you'll see that what we have here is a very Jesus-centered, Bible-focused, and what we would say is evangelical description of how we live our life together as a church. You'll see that this corresponds very well with uh, the Baptist faith and message that comes out of the Southern Baptist Convention in the 1960s. You'll also see that our statement of faith corresponds to the evangelical statement of faith that was endorsed by a Lausanne Conference. So you'll see that our statement of faith is something that is shared in common with Christians across the world and throughout history, in that it is focused on Jesus, it's centered in the Bible, it's also evangelical in its background. So. Take a look at those statements of faith, those documents that we have here, and the other documents that I've referenced. And if you have any specific question about those or any clarifications, please make a note of that and contact me or bring it to our workshop at the end of your time of having watched these videos, and I'll be happy to speak with you about these. If we take these basic beliefs as our statement of faith and we put them together into how we live our life together, 
that comes to the next of our statements, and that is our lifestyle statement. So our basic beliefs have implication for how we live our life together, how we translate them into action. And so if you want to know what we teach, what we preach, and what we practice, take a look at our basic beliefs. If you want to know how we agree to live our life together, then take a look at our basic beliefs. It doesn't mean that everybody in our church has to believe all of the same things. No, that's not the case. But it means that if it comes to a matter of our life together, what we do is we look at these basic beliefs as what guides our life together. And that's what leads us to this, our lifestyle statement, how we live as a church, a summary of the basics and how we translate them into our life together. And you'll see this down at the bottom of page 14. The first of the statements that we would make is that the Bible is our final authority. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, Paul writes, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. When it comes to matters of decision, we look to the scripture as our final authority. As Paul writes, it has God as its source, it has faith as its fundamental teaching, and it's also helpful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. It has everything that we need to know how to live according to faith and our practice. And so the Bible is our final authority. So when it comes to our life together, our worship experiences are structured around the Bible. Our preaching is structured around the Bible. What we teach our children is the Bible. What we discuss in our small groups is the Bible. What we proclaim in evangelism is the truth recorded in the Bible. So the Bible is our final authority and a major function of our life together. The second is this autonomy of each local church. The Bible says, and he, Christ, is the head of the body, the church. So for us, that means that we believe that Jesus Christ is the head of our church. It doesn't mean that as the pastor that I'm the head of the church. It doesn't mean that as a member of a certain denomination or a network of churches that they are the ruling body of our church. No, it means that Christ Jesus is the head of the body that is the church. And so we look to Jesus Christ for leadership. We look to Jesus Christ for direction. We look to Jesus Christ to be our Lord and our King. And therefore, as a local church, what we do is in our fellowship and our organization together and our life together, what we do is we consult Jesus Christ as our head, especially looking to the pages of scripture, and we do what Jesus asks us to do. That means that we make our own decisions as a church, as a church body, not as an individual, nor as a group, but as a church body. And it means that we make decisions independent of any outside influence. So we believe that we are personally responsible for ourselves, our decision-making, our support. We are a self-supporting, independent local church that does not depend upon any outside sources for funding or decision-making. We stand alone before Jesus Christ for our life together. The third thing is the priesthood of every believer. Peter writes, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, and that applies to you and to me. Peter would say, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, so that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. That means that each and every one of us stand personally responsible before God for the condition of our soul. That's the reason why we emphasize the importance of each individual making a personal choice of faith. We stand individually and personally responsible before God. 
At the same time, that means that we also have a responsibility toward one another, to come alongside one another and to encourage one another and to help one another. So we each stand personally responsible before God and we have a responsibility to one another in this family as priests and encouragers and helpers. So we believe that each and every person in the body of Christ is important. No one person is more important than the other, not even as the pastor. I have a very specific role, but I don't serve as a priest on behalf of all of the people. Every one of us serves as priest for one another, and we help one another, and we encourage one another, and we challenge one another in the family of faith, and we all stand personally responsible before God. That's the reason why we have a means of organizing our life so that every person has a vital role and participation in the life of the church, the priesthood of every believer. The next is something we've referred to in our first session, and that is two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Ordinance simply means an order or a command, and these are the two commands of Jesus Christ that we would baptize and that we would do the Lord's Supper regularly. And we've looked at these as two ways that we reflect on uh, our life in Christ, what Jesus Christ has done for us, and how we take that first step of obedience through baptism, and we take that repeated step of recommitment through the Lord's Supper. Those are the two ordinances that we practice as a church. In covenant relationship with God and with one another is another of the key ways that we live our life together. Paul writes in Ephesians, his intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That means that bottom line, when we commit ourselves to God, we are committing ourselves to one another as well. So the relationship we have with God means that we also have and share a relationship with one another, where we have agreements. We've pledged our life in obedience and loving service to God, and we pledge our lives to one another, and the relationship aspect is a key dimension of what it means to be the family of God. That's one of the reasons why family is one of the favorite words in all of Scripture for referring to the people of God. And our relationship with God and with one another, we take very seriously. It's at the heart, it's at the core of everything that we're about. And so we emphasize this covenant relationship with God and with one another. Spirit-led living is another one of the ways that we speak about our life together. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So we believe that this loving union with Jesus Christ, this slowed down spirituality where we are connected with Jesus, his spirit alive in us, empowering us to live the life of Christ that God intends, this is a vital part of our life together. It's not something that we're doing in our own energy. It's not something that we're doing as an organization. It's something that we are doing as an expression of our love relationship, intimately connected with God. It's something that we're doing empowered by God's Holy Spirit. In fact, living the Christ life apart from the Spirit is impossible, but only through the power of God's Holy Spirit can we live the life that God intends for us as individuals and as a church family. And so we believe that Spirit-led living following Jesus, not only individually and in our families, but also as a church family, is a key dimension of our life together. And then this notion of telling others about Christ, this too sort of gives direction to our life together. We believe that the church does not exist for itself. We exist for God's purpose in the world. The church has been given a purpose to exist, but not for itself. 
It's to serve Christ's purpose in the world. And that's the reason why Peter writes, but in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. So we believe that each individual has a responsibility as they follow Jesus to share the gospel good news with other people in their relational circles of influence. Jesus Christ as Lord makes a difference in our lives and it raises questions in the lives of people around us. So we believe that sharing that truth about Jesus Christ is an important part of our life as individuals, but it's also an important part of our life together as a church. The command, go into all the world and make disciples, is one that Jesus speaks not only to you as an individual, but to us as a church. And so we take seriously the responsibility of telling others about Jesus Christ. So as you take a look at your document here on page 15 and 16, it brings us to this part of our discussion where we conclude this notion about what it means to have our life lived together. And perhaps you might have seen it coming, perhaps you didn't. But this lifestyle statement reflects what it means to be uniquely us as a church family and why we identify as a, quote, Baptist church. Churches that choose to organize themselves around these lifestyle statements are known as Baptist churches. And while some groups are called Baptist, other groups are Baptist in their heritage, but they are not Baptist in their denominational affiliation. So you may say, wow, this is really interesting. I'm not a Baptist, but these are things that have been a part of the church that I came from. Well, the reason is, is because there's lots of different streams of the Christian family, and you'll see on your screen there that I've tried to illustrate that. There are Catholic churches, there are Lutheran churches, Anglican churches, Reformed churches, and then there's a main stream of the church family that's known as free churches. But these are the types of churches that are associated with or with whom Baptists are associated. Free churches, the churches that believe that each individual stands personally responsible before God, that the Bible is important, that each church has the responsibility of making its own decisions, that practices baptism and the Lord's Supper as the two orders of Christ, that believe that our relationship with God and our relationship with others is important, and that our discipleship of following Jesus is empowered by God's Holy Spirit, and that we are to share the gospel good news with others. That's something that's common with lots of Christians. And this is why we welcome people, welcome people whether they have a Baptist background or not, into our family of faith. Because we believe that a life lived together following Jesus Christ is a key to God's purpose and call on our church and our lives as individuals. So that is the second of the statements that we've looked at. We've looked at our faith statement and our lifestyle statement. What I'd like for us to do now is just to briefly take a quick look at some of these core values that are contained not only in these basic beliefs and these statements. The first two we've already introduced, Jesus-centered and Bible-focused, as we looked at our basic beliefs. Those are doctrinal or theological or truth statements. The next two are true of our church, but they are more cultural or they are more relational. And it's important for us to just let you know that a part of our core values is the fact that we are a multicultural church. We believe that there's something special that's taking place across the globe, and we get to experience it each and every day in our life together, and that is God calls people from the four corners of the earth to be a part of his family. And while in a lot of our backgrounds and experiences, we come from places where we didn't experience the fullness of that multicultural family, we believe that God is doing something wonderful and special to bring together people 
of different colors, of different classes, of different nationalities, of different statuses, all together. So we are multi-everything in our church, and we celebrate that. We believe that that's something that God is doing as a witness to his love, as a witness to his family, and as a witness to the world. The second of our core values that are listed here and that have to do with relationships is that we are a family-friendly church, and by that we mean a variety of things. One of the things is that we're, of course, open to families and children being a part of, of our church family, and so we take very specific steps to make sure that our kids feel welcome and that families have a place to bring their kids and that you don't have to be embarrassed because we recognize that kids can be loud and kids can be messy. Uh, that's, that's a part of being a family-friendly church. But we also realize that many of us are a long way from our families back home, if you will. And we believe that God is creating a new family here in our life together. So whether you're married or whether you're single, whether you have kids or whether you don't have kids, we believe that God wants each and every one of us to be a part of a new family that he's creating. And we want to be open to everyone having a place to connect. So these core values are also a vital part of who we are as a church. The next thing that I want to address as I kind of catch my breath and take a drink here uh, is our purpose and our mission statements. These statements are at the heart of why we exist and what we do as a church. If you've ever wondered, well, why do we do what we do as a church? Then I hope that over the next couple of minutes, you'll see in our purpose and mission statements, something of an explanation of why we do what we do. Our purpose and mission statements are based, as you might expect, on the two core beliefs in our values, and that is Jesus Christ and the Bible. And there are two what are called great statements that Jesus gave us that serve as the foundation for our purpose and our mission statement, our mission being what we do and our purpose being why we do what we do. And so on the top of page 17 in your notes, you'll see us discuss these two great statements. The first of the statements is the great commandment. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. Just briefly here, I want to point out the following truth, and that is notice how even in this particular great commandment, there is a priority of a love relationship with God and our love for others. Those two are at the heart and core of what it means for us to follow Jesus, and to share in our life together. And these two things serve as part of the foundation of our life together. And here, out of this particular statement, as you'll see on the top of page 17, we sense that God is speaking to us as a church to say the most important thing, why you exist as a church, is to do this, to love God to worship and serve him only. That's why we exist. We exist not for ourselves, but we exist for God's purpose. And God's purpose is a purpose of love. And when we enter into that love relationship with God and we get to know God for who he is, we want to worship him. We want to glorify him. We want to call attention to him and his goodness and his greatness. And as an expression of that, what we want to do is we want to serve him and God's purpose. It's not about us. It's about God. It's about focusing on God. It's about doing what God wants us to do. And so we believe that IBC Berlin has a great commandment purpose, and it's to love God, and that is a purpose of worship. Now, when you think of worship, it's not simply 
an idea of just coming to church and singing songs and listening to a message. No, we believe that worship is a full life expression of who we are and what God intends for us. So as we look at worship a little bit later, you'll see that it has implications beyond just attending a service that happens to be on a Sunday morning. Our purpose is to love God, to worship him in all of our life, and to serve him alone in everything that we do. The next of the statements, the Great Commission, says, Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. This is the Great Commission, something that we're familiar with. We believe that the first is a statement of our purpose, and together these statements give us a good framework for understanding God's purpose for our life as a church through certain priorities. There's one priority that comes to the highlight, and that is worshiping God, and the others serve that purpose in a variety of ways. Look at these two great statements, and our mission becomes making disciples out of a loving relationship with God, loving one another, and as we make disciples, what we do is we baptize them and we teach them. So if you'll look in your notes on page 17, you'll see that I've noted that these are what we call five disciple-making functions, and that's what shapes our mission. So our mission statement is the following. We exist to multiply and mobilize disciple-making followers of Jesus Christ. You can summarize that with a slogan that says, make disciples that make disciples. Notice how there is a multiplying effect there, so that when we make a disciple, that disciple then goes on to make a disciple who makes a disciple, and there's reproduction that's built into the great commandment mission that we believe the Bible teaches and that we have taken on. So we exist to multiply and mobilize disciple-making followers of Jesus Christ. And by mobilizing disciple-making followers, we believe that that means that each and every individual is to participate personally and actively in the global kingdom purpose that begins in the church. You'll see that on page 17. And that's the reason why we believe that disciple-making is a key expression of God's mission for us as a church. In other words, We want for God to use each and every individual, you, for the time that you are here at IBC Berlin, we want to make sure that you are equipped and mobilized to multiply and make disciples. We want God to do that for us. And so together, this great commandment purpose, this great commission purpose and great commandment mission is none other than focusing on these five great functions, our priorities. First is to love God with all your heart. That is what we say is worship. You'll find these at the bottom of page 17. To love your neighbor as yourself is ministry, giving ourselves away to one another in love. To go make disciples is evangelism, the responsibility of sharing our faith and reaching the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Baptizing is fellowship, drawing people and welcoming them into the family of God, and then teaching them all things. That is discipleship. That means educating and encouraging people in the process of growing to be more like Jesus Christ. So in your notes, what you'll do is you'll see that we spell these out a little more specifically. But before we move to that, let me make sure that you are with me here. First of all, our purpose is a great commandment purpose, and that is to love God, to worship him, and serve him only. And our great commission mission is to make disciples that make disciples. And the primary expression of that happens as we give ourselves to these these five great disciple-making functions of worship, ministry, evangelism, fellowship, and discipleship. 
Let's take a look at each of those a little more closely now. Under worship, we have this. We celebrate God's presence. We believe that God is with us each and every moment of the day. We've said that that loving union with God is vital to all of our life. That means that each and every moment of our day, we are to live in God's presence. And as a result, what we do is we celebrate God's presence by worshiping him and glorifying him. We magnify God in each and every expression of our individual life, but also when we come together, we believe that worship should be an expression of celebration. In other words, making God's presence known and enjoying that. That's the reason why we say that inspiring worship is one of the things that we long for at our church. And we see, and you'll see as well on page 18, that we try to accomplish that by exalting or lifting up the Father, uh, in a variety of ways, through singing, by inviting people to commitment, by praying, by hearing the word preached, by giving, by sharing with one another, through baptism, all of these kinds of things. So our style of worship at church is one of celebration, inspiration, and preparation. And that has to do with the selection of our uh, structure of worship, the kinds of songs that we sing, uh, the kind of preaching that we engage in, we long to be lifted up in our experience of God's presence, celebrating in worship. Some people have uh, commented about uh, how we do things in worship, uh, all the way from how we greet one another to the kinds of songs that we sing and and the way we do our, our sermons. And they've said, well, that's just not the way that we did it back home. And that's certainly true for most of us. It's because we are a unique family of God and we've made very deliberate choices about the style of music, the volume of music, uh, the way that we conduct our life together. We do so because we believe that magnifying God, celebrating God's presence, worshiping him, exalting him should be a celebration. It should be inspirational and then it should prepare us to go out and to live a life of worship each and every day. So worship is one of the key ways that we want you to be committed to God's purpose, not only individually, but also to our life together in the church. Worship is one of these five key disciple-making functions. The next is fellowship. That is where we incorporate God's family. In other words, we welcome believers into the family of God. We include them in the membership. They become brothers and sisters in relationship with God and with us. And as the scripture says, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people. And in a church like ours, a multicultural church, where people come from all over the world, many of us are foreigners, and some of us are rather alien, if you will. But each of us are a part of the family of God, and we are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens, family members, one with another. And we find that finding a place of, of connecting and being family together uh, here uh, as foreigners or aliens uh, is an important part of what God does. But as a result of us being family of God, we welcome everyone. And as a result, we devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, that is the quality of our relationships one to another, and to breaking of bread into prayer, which refers to worship. So it's important that we connect with one another. And we realize that doing so in large groups doesn't happen as well as it does in small groups or micro groups. So we encourage people to connect with one another in relationships that take place outside of Sunday gatherings. We encourage people to connect to small groups or to develop relationships between families or between individuals to form micro groups of developing, loving, deepening, authentic relationships with one another because fellowship is an important priority of disciple-making. 
The next you'll see on page 17 has to do with discipleship, where we educate God's people. So in the book of Hebrews, the writer says, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity. In discipleship, we believe that there is a process of growth. We begin as newborn babes in Christ. We've been born again, and it's important for us to progress and to grow from being an infant to being mature. And we leave elementary teachings, and we uh, in, instruct people, and we develop people uh, to become more mature, primarily through educating God's people through instruction and through encouragement. We believe that education or discipleship is as much about relationship as is it about information. In fact, information alone uh, is, is insufficient. It has to be paired with a personal relationship with God and a personal relationship with other believers so that in God's presence, his spirit, in God's truth from his word, in the presence of God's people together, that disciple-making environment moves us toward maturity so that we might, as Peter writes, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Not just information, but life transformation so that the fruit of the Spirit, the grace of God, is more and more a part of our lives. So we take seriously the importance of connecting with one another, of discipling one another, encouraging one another, and studying with one another the truths of God's Word. So maturity, educating, and growing, that's an important part of our life together. The next is ministry. We demonstrate God's love. We show God's love, and that's an important aspect of our life together. John writes by saying, this all this, I'm sorry, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love for one another. The measure of our maturity is love, and that love is demonstrated and shown as we love one another in very practical, real ways. So we serve one another in love. It happens not only as individuals where we care for one another, and we come alongside one another through our relationships, through our micro groups, our small groups, and our family connections, but also in our church life together. We believe that finding a place of service and ministry is a key way for us to show God's love to one another in the life of the church. And that's the reason why we think it's certainly true that God gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service. There are people that God has called to help guide each and every one of us to serve the Lord. God has called us to work or to serve, and that is a ministry that each and every one of us can take on, and that's an important dimension of our life together, our purpose of the priority of ministry. And then this idea of demonstrating God's love helps us understand that it's certainly true that for us, each and every person is a minister. Now, some people would say, oh, well, the pastor is our minister. Well, in one sense, that's true. But more specifically, I am the pastor, and the role that I have as a pastor is my ministry. But every person has a ministry. So if you are a part of God's family, then you have a ministry. That means that you are a minister. And we encourage every minister to have at least one task in the life of our church where you serve others in love. Every task, no matter what it is, is important. So you have an important contribution to make to the life of our church. Our goal is that each and every person that makes a commitment of membership would have at least one task of ministry and service as an expression of this priority. The last of these priorities is missions or evangelism. That's where we communicate God's grace. Acts 1.8 tells us, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. 
and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This is the responsibility that we have to communicate God's word. We take seriously our responsibility of sharing this good news of Christ, and our responsibility is to extend God's kingdom, beginning right where we're at, here in Berlin, through our relationships. But we believe God has a purpose for us beyond ourselves and beyond Berlin around the world. That's why we encourage individuals to tell people about Jesus, to invite them to our church, and to connect them to God's purpose of grace. That's why for us, it's important that we continue to reach out and expand in ways that give people the opportunity to connect with God's purpose. And so you'll see in your notes, that's also why we contribute significantly to ministries and works that are beyond us. We contribute at least 10% of our budget to missions or evangelistic outreach beyond ourselves, including helping church uh, starts in unreached people groups. So we believe that missions, communicating God's grace, is a fundamental priority for us as a church. So worship, fellowship, discipleship, ministry, and evangelism. These five disciple-making priorities grow out of those two great statements, the Great Commandment and the Great Commission, that make up our purpose and give expression to why we exist and what we do. As an important part of this, let me just bring our time together in this part of the seminar workshop just to say this. We believe that our church must never stop growing. Take a look at the bottom of page 19 and you'll see some of these things. We believe that our church should continually reach out to celebrate God's presence through worship, to incorporate God's family by welcoming those who come into the family of faith, that's fellowship, by building up and educating people, God's people to maturity, that is, of course, discipleship, demonstrating God's love by showing God's love to people in the church and outside the church by communicating God's grace. These are our priorities, and this is our discipleship pathway where we give ourselves to these priorities, and we believe that God wants us to grow in each of these areas. So that's the reason why we must be living, growing, and reproducing, because God wants people to love him. That's what worship is about. God wants us to love each other. That's where we welcome one another into the family relationships. God wants people to become more like Jesus, and that's the process of discipling and growing in maturity. God wants us to show his love to others, and that is ministry. And God wants people to come to him, and that's what evangelism does. So you and I must always be living growing and reproducing because God wants these things to happen. So we grow stronger through worship. We grow warmer through fellowship. We grow deeper through discipleship. We grow broader through ministry and we grow larger through outreach and evangelism. This is God's purpose for us and why we believe that it's important for us to continue to live and grow and become all that God wants us to become. So there's lots of reasons why we believe that God wants us to grow. It has to do with our priorities, it has to do with our purpose, and it has to do with God's mission on our life together. And that's the reason why we believe that as we grow larger, we must also grow smaller. We can't forget those fundamental commitments to relationships. So we grow larger by expanding in size and number, but we grow closer through connection in fellowship. We grow in the way that we uh, share our faith with others, but we also grow in that we share our love with one another. All of these things are important. And so in keeping with this, it's important that you understand that God has called us by purpose and by mission to be a healthy missional church.
And by that, I mean a church that's devoted to God's purpose and priorities, the ones that we've just talked about. We are to be purpose-centered, priority-given, as opposed to program-centered. We're to be balanced versus skewed. And by that, I mean that God wants us to live out of this passionate love relationship for him. That's his priority. That's his fundamental purpose, to worship him and to serve him alone. Out of that, we have a genuine love for one another. And we show that in authentic relationship with God, a real relationship, a relationship with others. That's what we're about, purpose-centered. It's not simply putting together programs. Programs must serve God's purpose of relationship. The other thing is that the relationships or our purpose needs to be balanced versus skewed. In other words, all five priorities should be present in the church life. We can't just enjoy gathering together on Sundays and expect that to create a healthy life of following Jesus. No, we have to get together in terms of fellowship, learning, serving, as well as sharing our faith, all five of the priorities in our life as a church and as individuals. And there should also be some sense of progression or movement. That's important for our life together. And we also should be not only healthy, but also missional. We're a church that's devoted to God's kingdom mission. The focus is God's kingdom, not our church. And we have an outreach or an evangelistic goal. So we are kingdom-centered in that we want to have a real connection with God and his purpose in the world. That's the reason why it's also to be relevant to every part of our lives. It's not about retreating from life and hiding in church as if it is separate from our lives. No, the church should empower us and equip us to live a real life in our relevant circumstances of family, of work, and play. And once again, it's something that is very relational. It has to do with our relationships. That's what it means to be kingdom-centered. And then finally, it's an evangelistic goal. We do not exist for ourselves. We, in our everyday relationships, live a lifestyle of evangelism and outreach. And as God gives opportunity, we share the gospel good news with others, not only as individuals, but that's how we also see our church, creating relational environments where we can welcome people to worship, to introduce them to Jesus Christ, where we can welcome them to our small groups, where we can welcome them to our events, and then they too can make a choice to become followers of Jesus Christ. This brings us to the conclusion of our second session, and I hope that this has helped you understand a little bit about who we are as a church, why we exist, what we do, what we believe, and how we put our life together. If you have any questions, please make a note of them on your listening guide and bring them to uh, the next Love Membership Workshop, where we'll take some time to, to open these things up and to answer some of those questions. Thank you for your participation in this. Let me close with a word of prayer, and then we'll conclude this session. God, we thank you that you have invited us to be your children through salvation in Jesus Christ, and that you put us together in the family of faith. Thank you for the International Baptist Church Berlin, and we thank you for the way that you have called us and given us a unique history and a unique purpose for this time and this place. Help us to love you, to worship you, to serve you only. Help us, God, to make disciples who make disciples by giving ourselves to the priorities of worship, fellowship, discipleship, ministry, and evangelism. May we indeed be kingdom-focused. May we indeed be a healthy, balanced church for your glory and the good of your church and the good of your people, I pray this. Amen. Thank you. I hope to uh, see you soon at uh, the next session and at our next Love Membership Workshop. Have a good afternoon.